Good afternoon, everyone. Wow, that was really good. Uh, I'm Dave Smithwick. I'm the Chief HR Officer. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration. Um, we have a, a wonderful lineup for you today, so we're very glad that you're here. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. Day is a federal holiday, as we all know. And um, anyone know on the what regular day is it is observed? It is the third Monday of every January, um, irrespective of what date that falls on. Now, Dr. King's birthday is January 15th. He was born in 1929, so he would have been 84 today. I think my math is right. Um, he was also born in Atlanta. Many of you may know that. Um, and Dr. King was pretty successful in the classroom. Some of you may also know that he skipped the ninth grade and the 11th grade uh, before he went to college and entered uh, Morehouse at the age of 15. Um, pretty impressive. Um, 15, I think I was just trying to figure out how to get to one of my classes in high school. <coughs> um, uh, he had many opportunities to go to prestigious universities during his PhD and uh, eventually went to Boston University. Uh, completed that work in 1955. Um, many of you also know that uh, Dr. King was a noted Baptist minister and much of his deep spiritual beliefs guided who he is and who he, who he was and how he lived his life. And today we celebrate that life, albeit a short one, because he was assassinated in 1968. So this was the CNBC trivia question on today's show. I watch that on the treadmill in the morning a lot. Um, which president and in what year um, enacted and put into law the observance of Martin Luther King Day? No, it was Ronald Reagan in 1983. Ronald Reagan in 83. Um, so it was actually first observed in 1986. So um, that was the first observance. And it actually took until 2000 before all 50 states recognized it as a holiday. Um, so is, as we prepare to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day, it's also a significant um, year in Duke history. Uh, 2013, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the first African-American students that enrolled uh, un at undergraduate studies, in undergraduate studies at Duke. And there are a number of events that I would encourage you to look at on the HR and other websites around Duke to attend. And one I just wanted to highlight for you is that on Friday, this coming Friday, the 25th, uh, for at 7 p.m. at the Nasher Museum, there's a kickoff of the commemorative events um, celebrating this 50th anniversary. Um, all are invited to attend. It'll be a wonderful opportunity, again, to uh, be at the Nasher, um, experience some of the history of Duke, uh, again, that kind of drives what uh, is our university today in terms of you know, being a place where we are, are inclusionary in our thinking and are diverse in our population. Um, so as we get started today, I want us all to um, take an opportunity to just remember that our diverse environment enriches our minds, it enriches our interactions with each other, um, and it also defines who we are and how we live that life of inclusion. So may we never forget that we should embrace the differences that we see in each other and learn from them and take that as an opportunity to be inclusionary in all we do in our lives, um, it will hold a lot more promise for all of our futures if we take that approach. And we are going to start today with a musical uh, number by two of our DCRI staff members. Toddy Stewart is going to be playing guitar and Queen of Green is going to sing. Um, and so I ask them to come up now and please welcome them and give them a round of applause. Dr. Dr. Christopher Edwards will be our uh, keynote speaker, and I'll introduce him after the song. Thank you. 
It must have been colder in my shadow To never have sunlight in your face You were content to let me shine that your way Always walk the step behind. I was the one with all the glory. You were the one with all the strength. A beautiful face with such a name. I never once heard you complain. Did you ever know that you're my hero? And everything I'd like to be. my wings it might have appeared to go unnoticed but I have it all here in my heart I want you to know I know the truth I would be nothing without you did you ever know that you're my hero and everything I'd like to be my wings did you ever know that you're my hero and everything I'd like to be I can fly higher than an eagle the wind beneath my wings fly 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 against the sky I thank you I thank you I thank God for you the wind beneath my wings. Thank you so much. We had a small gift for Queen and Toddy, and I uh, just wanted to thank them so much for that. Um, Dr. Edwards, that's a, a hard act to follow. <laughs> but I know you can do that. Um, I do want to introduce uh, Dr. Christopher Edwards uh, to you. We are very proud uh, to have him here and very thankful that he allocated time to come share with us today. Um, Dr. Edwards is a licensed clinical psychologist and uh, research psychoneuroendocrinologist. 
Um, he's a medical director of the Biofeedback Laboratory and Pediatric Neurology Service and director of the Chronic Pain Management Program at Duke. Um, he's an expert in assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of chronic pains and factors that influence health outcomes among minority and black populations. He's published more than 100 peer review articles um, in medical and psychosocial journals. He's given more than 300 national and international professional presentations and is a frequent contributor to media outlets public and publications like the Wall Street Journal. I did tell Dr. Edwards that after I printed out a CV, I had to get a new printer cartridge. Um, <laughs> it's impressive. Um, uh, Dr. Edwards has been at Duke since 1999, uh, his first faculty appointment. He's associate professor with appointments in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine and the Department of Medicine in the Division of Hematology. Um, he also has a clinical appointment at the uh, Veterans Hospital and he serves as a training faculty in the Duke Residency Training Program, the Clinical Psychology Internship Program, and Duke University's Graduate Program in Clinical Psychology. Um, Dr. Edwards is going to share with us his presentation and lecture titled, Living the Dream in Medical Research, a Model Using Sickle Cell Disease. And Dr. Edwards says that he is a scientist and a clinician. But before all of that, um, I am a I, am, I was and remain a black man in America with an appreciation for Martin's struggle and what it means for me today. Hence, my lecture title simply reflects that I would never give an MLK talk without diligence to the dream. Dr. Edwards. I'll need the guitar. Very good. Welcome. Good afternoon. You got to say it like you mean it. Good afternoon. All right. We're going to talk like we're going to enjoy the next hour. I am absolutely honored and privileged to be here today to be asked to speak on such a phenomenal occasion as the MLK celebration at Duke. I don't know how many of you were here 50 years ago. I'm not going to have you raise your hand. <laughs> but Duke, Durham, North Carolina, and America was a different place. We've made some changes. I want to call it progress. But we still have a lot yet to do. And so I have really just two objectives for my presentation today. Actually three. The first is I will not sing. <laughs> the second one is I want to make sure that in the context of the science I give due diligence to Dr. Martin Luther King. The third is to highlight work directly from our lab that I think begins to speak to the dream and the vision of Martin Luther King. I hope to do that all in an hour. I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> I would actually, before I move too much further, be remiss in not acknowledging some of our very significant contributors and collaborators in the room. Dr. Laura DeCastro, the medical director in the Sickle Cell Center, Elaine Whitworth, and many others. I appreciate them being here in support. They will see their names quite frequently. So, It is of interest for me, being in the Department of Psychiatry, this, this notion of a, a dream versus a vision. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting to me, because all I ever hear about as it relates to Martin Luther King is the dream. You know, where I'm from, dreams are what sleep people do. <laughs> Not many people have dreams who are awake. People who are awake and alert have visions. And so today in my presentation, you're not going to hear much about the dream. You're not going to hear much about what sleep people do. I hope to chat with you just a little bit about what the awake, 
are doing. The vision, the manifestation of a vision, just five decades ago or so, Martin marched in Selma, Alabama. Just five decades ago or so, he stood on the mall in Washington, D.C., and gave a very, very powerful speech, really moving civil rights for African Americans forward. But I suggest to you that if you look close enough within that vision, you actually begin to see a vision for medicine. And I find that interesting because I think there is a vision for medicine in Martin Luther King's dream. A part of that vision includes having faculty and staff that look like, talk like, eat like, smell like the populations that they serve. It is a fascinating vision. The second part of that vision is that you come into a center and the services that you get as a patient are not disparate based on your age or your race or the way you talk or your use of language, that everybody gets the same for the same reason. It is based on that that I actually began doing medical research. And I was actually very fortunate back in 2000, 1999, 2000, 2001, I worked with Frank Keefe, and he was asked to do a paper on which I am co-published to look at a particularly prominent journal and ask, are there people in that journal who look like me? Are there blacks represented in the science that this particular journal has produced? I don't know if you can see this. I'll try to help you through it. But our findings were extraordinarily interesting. If you look five columns over, you will see a column entitled Race, Ethnicity, and Culture. You will see a legend down the right-hand side that essentially represents the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And what you will find, to my dismay, is that the first 30 years of the journal never mentioned the word black as it related to pain. The 1940s, the 1950s, and the 1960s produced exactly zero papers that provided guidance on how I experienced pain. The 1970s were fascinating because there was a 200% increase. Two papers. <laughs> We went to sleep for a little bit in the 1980s because we, we dropped by 100%. There was only one paper published in the 1980s. And then the 1990s, you will note, again, we published this in 2002, the vast majority of what we knew about blacks and pain had been generated since 1990. Now there are those who would say this is not a current day problem. This is old news. There are those who would say that not here, everything's okay. I come today to say everything's not okay. We're actually following up on this particular study to see what has happened over the past decade. It began to generate a science that says in the 1990s, really governed by guidance from the federal government, we began to include blacks. We began to include women. After 2000, we began mandated, we began mandated, uh, we, be, we began to respond to mandates for the inclusion of children in research. But I am fascinated to see how we have done. That paper was published. I was writing another paper that really began to consolidate the following ideas, that race is relevant in the consideration of pain. That we don't all experience pain the same way. We know from our research that women 
respond differently than men, that blacks respond differently than whites, that the aged respond differently than those who are young. And so we begin grappling with that in the literature and really putting forth a model that says these are relevant considerations to include in the conceptualization of pain. I ultimately, several years later, and again with many of the colleagues that sit in the audience, we were able to put out a sort of comprehensive review that said psychosocial and racial and age-related issues and racial discrimination was in fact relevant for the conceptualization of sickle cell disease, a disorder that really is characterized often by the manifestation of chronic pain. We went as far as to say that if you're conceptualizing sickle cell disease and not really including these issues, you really have not conceptualized sickle cell disease. You've missed the boat. The ultimate model that that, that first few years of, of experience in my life generated is actually captured here. And I want you familiar with this because this will actually guide and give credibility to almost everything that we'll talk about after. This model says simply that if you want to understand any single person's report of chronic pain, their experience of pain, you need to consider all of these factors. Certainly, Biology is relevant, and we often start with biology. You often go into your doctor's office and say, it hurts right here, and the doctor says, let's see what we can find out. But sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes pain persists, although healing has occurred. Sometimes pain persists and exists even when the radiographs and the MRI say there's nothing there. And in those cases, it's sometimes important to have additional data that you can look at. We recognize that a person's thinking is relevant to how they experience pain. When they see their disorder, when they see their disease as an obstacle to be overcome, they tend to do pretty well. When they see that same disease as a debilitating obstacle that is going to change their lives in an irrefragable way, they tend not to do very well. Positive thinking is associated with better clinical outcomes. Negative thinking associated with more poor clinical outcomes. The same thing is true for our emotions. We recognize that depression and anger and hostility are often very much associated with greater reports of chronic pain. We recognize that happiness and joy and peace are associated with lower reports of chronic pain. Now really related to what we're talking about today, all of those things occur in a social context that is often neglected. When you see your environment as unequal, when you believe that you've been discriminated against, when you perceive racism or ageism, sexism, you tend to do more poorly than when you believe and feel that things are equal. Social context is important. Let's begin to present some of the data specifically related to sickle cell disease that supports the notions that I've talked about so far. To summarize for many of you who really don't know what sickle cell disease is, I, I have a graphic and you'll see these beautiful round disc shaped cells. Those are normal red blood cells. They contain elements um, like oxyhemoglobin and carbamino. shaped cells. They're very interesting for several reasons. First, they don't carry gases very good. And so they are not very good at restoring tissues. Their shape actually allows them to occlude small vessels. 
and produce pain. And what happens on the other side of the occlusion often is that those tissues die. If that occlusion occurs in the brain, you may have a stroke. If that occlusion occurs in an organ, that organ may fail after a period of time. The point of this particular graphic really is that these patients often suffer a tremendous disease burden. They often begin narcotic medications at an age that is extraordinarily young compared to other disease states. Their hospital utilization is extraordinarily high. They end up in the emergency rooms quite frequently. The number of days that they're hospitalized is high, and the number of days that they spend in the hospital once hospitalized is very high. They show up in emergency rooms with some degree of frequency. And so they often are characterized as drug seeking. That's us talking to them. They often are viewed as having a motive other than pain relief for the services that they seek. We'll talk about sickle cell disease more as we go along. Around 2000, 2001, again, as a result of everything I've talked about, we began a study. And uh, the study I've the study design I've kind of laid out for you here because it characterizes most of the data that uh, you will see subsequently. The design of the study is longitudinal. We follow patients every year with an 800 item survey. Now, I don't know if you've filled out 800 questions recently, but uh, that, that's a burden in and of itself too. I, I'm a part of the disease burden. Um, we also do a medical records review um, to see what new findings there are. We look at healthcare utilization, we look at number of emergency room visits and other kinds of things. We currently follow about 171 subjects in the study. Uh, age ranges 18 to 75, mean age about 34. Education, it is a relatively educated sample, about uh, almost 14 years of uh, education on average. We followed them with a large number of psychiatric and psychological questionnaires and surveys. We evaluate depression and stress and anxiety and pain and coping and anything else we can think of, to be honest with you. The goal is to learn as much as we can about the subjects. Ultimately, there are exclusions like they can't be in an acute crisis at the time of our evaluation. And we see all of the patients when they come for their normal hematological visits and hematology clinic. So one of the first things that we were interested in is mood and affect. How is their mood? And um, this is a paper produced by one of our students, Michael Stanton. Um, this paper is interesting for me for the following reason. It says the following, and I'll, I'll try to summarize it for you. their heart, they have it in their head. Doctors are just extensions of the plan that they already have for themselves. Often when you go to find the plan, you don't do as well. A paper related to that, and I'm actually very pleased, this paper just came out uh, four days ago, five days ago. Um, and so you're getting hot off the press. You're the first people to see it. Too bad I don't know what's in it yet, but yes. <laughs> the, the idea in a very similar way is that locus of control is relevant. That people who have it inside, who see the medical center as a tool for them, tend to do best. Those individuals who are relying on the medical center for answers who are dependent on the medical sense, uh, system for their resolutions tend to do most poorly, tend to have the greatest levels of depression, tend to have the lowest quality of life. This is one of the papers, there, there are very few papers that I think 
move researchers, but this was one paper that moved me in a substantial way. I talked earlier about us not, about blacks not being represented in the scientific literature. And I think this is one of the papers that actually specifically denotes why that's relevant. This is a paper that demonstrates that when you look at the factors that predict suicide and depression in African Americans, it tends to be different than those factors we have historically known to be associated with depression and suicide in our white colleagues. Being sad and getting sadder is often a characteristic of increased suicidality in whites. In this sample of blacks, they tend to have an elevation of their mood before suicide. They don't get sadder, they get happier. So your patient has come in day after day, week after week, and they've been depressed. And suddenly they show up and they're smiling. And they're happy. They're excited. Maybe it's time to ask what's going on. In this particular case, we found that they have found a mechanism for relief. It is that the contemplation of suicide is liberating in a way that it elevates the mood. So one of the risk factors for suicide in patients with um, sickle cell disease is a change in mood, not just depression. We found very similar uh, factors that produce depression, uh, things that you would anticipate to produce, uh, predict depression, actually did not predict depression. There is a need for ongoing research to really define how blacks behave and blacks look when they are ill. So not just depression. This was a pretty fascinating study that we did, uh, another one of my students, uh, in the fear of movement. Uh, the, the kinesophobia is the technical word, and I can explain it to you really easily. If you go to your doctor and you say, each time I do this, it hurts, what is your doctor supposed to say to you? God, that was amazing. You all have been promoted. Stop doing your hand, and it'll stop hurting. The brain actually teaches itself that, though, over time. If movement produces pain, then what do you do? You stop moving. And over time, that fear of movement, that hesitancy to engage physical activity, produces deconditioning. It produces a worsening of your physical status and often an exacerbation of your pain. <coughs> Kinesophobia before this particular paper had never really been applied to a sample of blacks and never applied to sickle cell disease. This paper actually demonstrated for the first time that kinesophobia is a relevant predictor of deconditioning, who will and will not engage in physical exercise and who may or may not ultimately have greater pain. Somatization is another area that we studied as it relates to mood, and the concept here is pretty simple. If I give you 18 to 24 hours a day to do nothing other than think about your pain, guess what you're going to do? You're going to think about your pain. If you don't have a life, Pretty much not having a life is detrimental to your pain. If you don't have distractions, if you don't have interpersonal relationships, if you don't have people that make you mad occasionally, if you don't have people that put some waves on the water, you tend to just sit and focus on what's wrong. I always hesitate to do in-press papers, but I'm going to do one now. This paper is actually in-press in pain research and treatment, and I mention it because it really is relevant. The patients with sickle cell disease that are most susceptible to the development of depression are those patients who have a negative reaction to the experience of pain. I want to go back just a little bit. 
and remind you of what I said about thinking. Thinking is relevant. When you see your disease as something to be overcome, you tend to overcome it. When you see it as an obstacle, you tend to be debilitated by it. Here's clinical evidence in a paper that is up and coming that that principle applies. Patients that have the greatest negative reaction to their pain have an epidemiology of depression that is exponentially higher than their colleagues that respond positively to their pain. Coping is relevant, and one of the primary coping mechanisms that I was interested in when I first came to sickle cell research was religion and spirituality. And we ask in this particular study a very simple question. Was church attendance and religious behavior associated with better or worse pain ratings? And what we found was that those who engaged in weekly church attendance, those who engaged in religious activities, tended to do better than those who didn't. Now at the end of the study, we recognize that we had probably asked more questions than we had answered. In true, what we didn't know is if healthier people were just more likely to go to church and the sick people were in bed unable to go to church, or if church actually had a curative effect, if it had a, a positive coping effect. And so we engaged several additional studies. Carol O'Connell, in this particular study, asked the very relevant question, is more always better when it comes to religious coping? Is there a linear relationship between religious coping and clinical outcomes for patients with sickle cell disease? In our findings, I will summarize for you here, the answer is no. Extremes at either end are associated with poor outcomes. Those who have nothing but religion don't have much. Sometimes you have to get off your knees and get on your feet. You have to take your medicine. You have to go visit the doctor. You have to go running on the treadmill. If you're always on your knees, you get deconditioned just like everybody else. At the opposite end, we found that those with no faith, no belief system, often did pretty well the first crisis, but were not able to endure. They got exhausted pretty easily. And so we found that at both ends of the spectrum, people did poorly. The people who did best, we call them the moderate middle. They knew when to pray. They knew when to fight. They know when to be on their knees. They know when to be on their feet. They did pretty well, the moderate middle. Now, Kamala McDougall asked a question around the exact same time, actually published in the exact same journal at the exact same time, if all coping was equal. And so we took three commonly thought about mechanisms for coping among African Americans. Hostility, active coping, and prayer. And we simply compared them. We asked, was one better than the other? And what we ultimately determined was, no. One is not better than the other. Each tends to be done best by a particular type of person. It's what you get used to. Have you ever been in a room with a person who does not curse, who is trying to curse? <laughs> they, they look so awkward. They, they say things that ain't supposed to go together. It comes out funny. Nobody takes them serious. The idea is that there are coping mechanisms that differ depending on who you are. What you get used to is what you tend to do best. Some patients learn very early that if I go into clinic and I make a lot of noise, I cuss two people out at the front desk, they get me through quickly. <laughs> they get me in and out 15 minutes, I'm in and out. 
If I don't do that, I sit for three hours like the rest of you. Other patients learn that active coping, doing things for themselves, is the best way to get uh, things done. And other patients learn that prayer, internalizing it, is the best way to do it. I suggest to you that we didn't find differences. What we confirmed was that what you do is what you probably should continue to do if it's working. We asked the question at some point, and this was published in 2006, are your parents relevant at all? And, and we couldn't figure out a, a way to to really discern that. And so we developed a simple questionnaire that asked if your parents abused substances, alcohol and or drugs, when you were a child. And it was a simple yes, no answer. And we took that answer and in a regression equation attempted to predict clinical outcomes for patients with sickle cell disease. And what we found was absolutely fascinating patients, adult patients, whose parents abused alcohol or substances when they were young, reported greater levels of pain, greater levels of psychiatric morbidity, and lower levels of quality of life than their counterparts whose parents did not abuse substances. Our conclusions were simple, that what you see is relevant too that your environment really does influence ultimately how you cope, how you treat and manifest your diseases. Related to that, we did a brief um, study and we ultimately uh, just presented it as a letter to the editor because of the small n, but I think the relevance of the study is consistent with what I'm talking about. We did an adoption study and we simply asked patients if they were adopted or not, and those were, who were adopted we compared to those who were not. Patients who were adopted actually did better. They had lower levels of pain and better psychiatric profiles than those patients who were not adopted. Here we evoked what I call an inoculation effect, that some stress in your life actually makes you stronger. I know you've heard those things that don't kill you make you stronger. Here it is in real life. I think those patients in our um, guiding theory here is that those patients with those early psychosocial stressors who still were able to manage them grew and developed coping in a way that their counterparts who did not have those experiences may not have had an opportunity to do. We've looked at weight and nutrition and I'm really proud of this paper. It says a couple of things. One that among patients with sickle cell disease, their eating habits tend to change and ultimately their health status changes when they're in pain. When they're in pain, they tend to crave fats and sweets. They tend to stay away from vegetables and fruits. Now, any nutritionists in the room? Good. <laughs> yes, the idea is all the stuff you need, all the healthy stuff, they tend to stay away from when they're stressed and in pain, and all the bad stuff they tend to eat. It ultimately results in, and this was the first paper to demonstrate, that 50% of our sample was either overweight and or obese. Now that is quite relevant for a population of patients with sickle cell disease who have historically been insulated from obesity by their disease state, who have historically been insulated from normal morbidities of African Americans like hypertension and diabetes, they were insulated from those by death. They died early. And so the idea that they are living longer did not necessarily translate to the idea that they were living better. And so this was one of the first papers that we were able to demonstrate that on. Very similarly, body image. And we all have body image issues. I, I, I'm not going to make you raise your hand again. But the idea about this paper was we confirmed the literature that women have body image issues and it influences many aspects of their psychiatric and physical presentations. But here we were able to demonstrate the exact same phenomena in men. We don't often think about that. That men have the exact same body issues that women have. 
and it tends to affect them in the exact same way. The worse the body image, the greater the pain, and also the greater uh, the psychiatric morbidities, the greater the depression, the greater the anxiety, the greater the whole constellation of illnesses. Body image is relevant not just for women, but also men. We studied some aging, and particularly in patients with sickle cell disease, the constant assaults to the brain, the low oxygen to the brain, the strokes to the brain, actually are relevant. They do have consequence for many patients. And in truth, the patients have not gotten the responses from us that they need. When you're 65 and you have a stroke, there are a lot of things that happen to you. There are a lot of resources that we throw at you. There are a lot of docs we make you see. Rehab, Medicaid pays for it, Medicare pays for it. When you're five and you have a stroke, things tend to be a little different. When you're 16 and you have a stroke, we tend to treat you differently. So this was one of the first papers where we began to grapple with that idea that there are things happening to this young black population that we need to attend to that ultimately influences their quality of life. Dr. Fellyu recently published a paper um, that uh, in a very similar way with data suggested that men tend to do worse than women in terms of their neurocognitive profiles. That women seem somewhat insulated by the effects of stroke and the multiple assaults, the hypoxia, the anoxia, but men t uh, tended to be very susceptible to the consequences of sickle cell disease. Treatment, and I'm, I can tell you already, I'm coming close to an end. For those of you who are excited about my in, this is when you get excited. <laughs> treatment, we did a review of treatment where we simply ask what are the relevant treatments that are available for patients with sickle cell disease. We were astonished in a couple of things. Uh, there were not a lot of treatments available and that those that were available, the patients tended not to get. That's really the, the, the bottom line for that particular patient. Uh, Dr. Fell, you uh, recently looked at pharmacology and we found the same sorts of things. There are narcotics that work for the population. There are things that help remediate and reduce their pain. They don't always get it because of the reactions they get from us when they come in for care. They often uh, tend to forego for long periods of time treatment because they don't want to be seen as drug seeking. They won't they don't want the psychosocial consequences of what they get when they come in for care. Future directions, this is a complicated graphic. I'll gladly email it to you. The things in red are those paths that we have explored and we have data for and or papers for. My summary is really straightforward. Medicine, medical research, clinical practice is a microcosm of the society. Things that happen out there also happen in here. Discrimination, inequity, racism, sexism are often active in the community, but we tend to see the medical center as a buffer. I come today to say that that buffer is not as strong as you may believe and that we really have to attend to these issues in a very prominent way on a day-to-day -day basis. Our work often discusses groups. We talk about blacks, we talk about women, we talk about the aged or young, but the truth of the matter is we still have to deal with individuals and our ultimate task must be to provide a high quality service to individuals, not groups. I've never had a group come to my office for, for services. <laughs> my conclusion is really straightforward. I think there is a part of the dream and the vision that impacts medical care and medical practice. And we approach that and we address it in a consistent way as we attempt to eliminate health disparities. Thank you.
Dr. Edwards, thank you so much. Um, we do have a, a minute if anyone has a question for Dr. Edwards. Anybody like to ask a question? While you're thinking about that, I do want to thank uh, Gina Streety. Gina worked with Dr. Edwards to get him here. Thank you so much, Gina. And, and I also want, to, uh, also want to thank Liz Faust. Liz does a great job at coordinating our research conference uh, every Tuesday. Thank you so much for all the work you do, Liz. <laughs> One last opportunity. Any uh, questions for Dr. Edwards? Dr. Edwards, maybe you stay for a minute. People might have some individual questions and to offer thanks. Thank you so much for, for coming, and everyone have a great rest of the day.